Welcome back. In the last video, I talked about the role of domestic budgets. Let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture of climate finance for adaptation. Pradeep Kurukula Surya from UNDP can tell us more about that. Investing in climate change adaptation um, is important because we see the effects of extreme weather events today on people's lives and assets. We also see the effects of long-term changes of climate on options for livelihoods, for development uh, trajectories which uh, are different and constrained than they were in the past. Now, climate change through these kinds of effects that we see are having a significant impact on GDPs today. In some cases, it's about a 9% uh, loss of GDP. In other cases, it can be as much as 20-30%, especially for some of these smaller countries. Now, the question is whether one should do something about it or not. And if you were to do the analysis, we would come to the conclusion that it is far cheaper uh, to avoid and minimize damages um, than it is to do nothing. So investing in adaptation is, becomes a, a critical part of, of any country, of any uh, economy, in order to minimize uh, damages that otherwise uh, will unfold uh, across uh, many countries around the world. And these damages are likely to get worse and, and far more severe in size and magnitude as uh, climate change itself remains uh, unchecked. So, how do we take it forward from here? Public finance for adaptation comes from both international sources and from the domestic budget. But public finance alone won't be enough. In fact, right now, we are facing an adaptation finance gap. It is estimated that the costs of adaptation will range from $140 to $300 billion by 2030. This means that the total finance for adaptation in 2030 would have to be 6 to 13 times more than the available international public finance today. Countries will have to rely on a mix of public, private, international and domestic finance. What are the sources for international climate finance? International public climate finance is available from three major sources, global climate funds, governments and agencies, and multilateral development banks. On the other hand, international private climate finance is sourced from commercial financial institutions and households, among others. In both cases, much more financing is available for mitigation than for adaptation even though investment and adaptation can also increase financial returns. Let's expand a bit on our discussion on international public climate finance. We will delve into the Green Climate Fund, or GCF, as a case study. We have invited two senior specialists from the GCF to tell you more. Let's hear from Janie Vru and Jason Spensley. Let me explain how the Green Climate Fund works as a funding mechanism for adaptation action. The Green Climate Fund is the largest dedicated fund for climate change. Uh, half of its resources are to be allocated for adaptation. The, um, it is mandated by the UNFCCC to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And the objective of the fund is really to be catalytic and promote uh, a partnership for climate resilient and low emission development pathways. The other important feature of the GCF is the investment criteria. One of them is the impact potential for uh, adaptation. And this really means that we look at the, if the project is ambitious and reaching the fun objective and, and well targeting the results area for adaptation. Unlike other climate funds, the GCF purposefully aims for a 50-50 balance in investment for adaptation and mitigation and can help fill the adaptation finance gap. We would also like to know if the GCF supports the planning of adaptation and how. The support of the Green Climate Fund to adaptation planning stems from the Climate Change Convention's Conference of the Party uh, Party's request to the GCF to expedite support uh, for adaptation planning to developing countries. In mid-2017, the board to the Green Climate Fund decided to uh, support developing countries on 
NAPS, National Adaptation Plans, and or other adaptation planning processes. This support is uh, provided and managed as a component of the readiness program of the GCF, which uh, supports countries in strengthening their pipelines of projects and, and programs uh, for funding uh, through, the, through the GCF. The adaptation planning support program of the GCF is now fully operational. Uh, the system for receiving the proposals, for commenting on them, for the, the approval, the endorsement and approvals process, and for dispersing the funds are now um, operating. As of late October 2017, 36 countries have submitted proposals for adaptation planning support uh, to the GCF. Thank you, Jason. Let's look at a specific example of an adaptation and agriculture project and its link to the NAP in Senegal. So I'll provide you now one example of a project, an adaptation project in agriculture that was recently approved. It's a project in Senegal that is focusing on building the resilience of small older farmers uh, that are highly vulnerable to climate change and also highly food insecure. So the project is taking a comprehensive approach, uh, looking at uh, the risk and promoting the creation of um, climate resilient assets, as well as the adoption uh, of climate resilient practices, providing climate information, as well as an agricultural weather-based uh, insurance. So this project is very interesting because the results will be uh, mainstreamed to the national adaptation planning process that is just starting in Senegal. So it will be a bottom-up approach to, to develop the NAP. Um, and also it's a very good example of an adaptation project that could be replicated elsewhere and other countries. Thank you, Jamie. There is something else about the innovative approach that the GCF takes. It is using public investment, primarily from developed countries, to stimulate private finance. Governments can play a crucial role in terms of unlocking national and international level private finance for adaptation. For example, they can strengthen institutional, legal and regulatory frameworks to encourage climate change investment. Micro and small sized enterprises can be important stakeholders in climate finance. While they may invest in adaptation measures of their own accord, they also need help from governments to be able to expand their businesses. To this end, in Malawi, the GCF is funding a project to scale up the use of modernized climate information and early warning systems. The project focuses on non-revenue generating investments, such as enhancing hydrometeorological capacity for early warnings and forecasting and the development of demand-based products, including those for farmers. The specific aim is to catalyze private finance. Let's hear a little more from our experts on the role of private finance. So, so there is a, a general a tendency to think of adaptation as an in intervention that requires public finance. In, to a large extent, that is true. Uh, many of the interventions required are public goods, where benefits of uh, intervention uh, cannot be excluded from some people. Um, everybody can, can benefit from it. And certainly in, s in those cases, such as flood protection works or early warning systems, there is a very legitimate reason to use public finance. However, the reality is that most choices that we're going to make are likely to be private in nature. In other words, we're going to make those choices out of our self-interest. And when you have that kind of uh, situation unfold, it is not always the case that public finance is the most efficient type of financing to use. In those cases, there is a legitimate reason to explore options for private financing and or to, to structure finance in such a way that uh, the benefits that uh, one sees through various projects or programs last well beyond what public finance alone can provide. And in those cases, it is necessary uh, to uh, foster partnerships um, with the private sector and to not only direct or attract uh, financing from the private sector, 
but also to redirect financing from the private sector into investments that they perhaps hadn't thought of uh, or planned for without taking climate into account. So adaptation, in fact, requires both a public and private financing in order that the, the solutions that we are seeking to see long-lasting uh, change take place. We see the advantages of private finance. And yet, there remain some barriers in mobilizing private finance to scale up adaptation. Let's hear from Adriana Dinu, Executive Coordinator of Global Environment Finance Unit at UNDP, on some of the challenges. Rohini will then shed some light on how UNDP is helping countries to overcome some of these. So public finance can be deployed very, very strategically in to attract private sector investments by creating the markets, by spurring innovation and by reducing the risks. The countries need to be supported in accessing, combining and sequencing a variety of financial instruments and sources of fund for um, climate investment. It is very challenging today for developing countries to navigate the maze of uh, climate finance architecture and understand which are the financial instruments or the sources of funds to be used at one, uh, uh, at one time. I think the most important area that UNDP is engaged on is actually the barrier of how to attract climate finance. The issue is that scaling up climate finance for adaptation is not something, uh, is not easily evident because the private sector does not have an incentive to invest necessarily in, an, in adaptation, uh, either their own adaptation or as a financer because it's not, the returns are not very clear. A lot of the, 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 the barriers of attracting climate finance require that much more innovative programs are designed. So the, the innovative design of programs engaging with more the micro private sector engaging with uh, good examples of initiatives that have been implemented over the last four to five years. Uh, those are the examples that, we are, that are being used to address the barrier of designing uh, robust programs to attract climate finance. As our focus is on the agricultural sectors and the adaptation activities within these, we need to understand the specific problems relating to these different financing options. Astrid will help us with that. It's not just public budget, of course, that's critical, because as we know in the agriculture sector, the critical investments are actually done by the private sector, in particular by farmers. Now, farmers are not always able to access the kind of finance they need. Partly this is because they have a limited asset base, especially when we're talking about small and vulnerable farmers, but also partly because the, the financial services simply are not available. The financial services are not available because the risks are manifold and especially with climate change are actually often increasing. And the many financial service providers don't have the structures in place in order to meet this kind of difficult market. So they withdraw from it or don't actually serve it. The way that we can try to work towards having a better uh, part of climate finance for uh, climate smart agricultural development is on the one hand for public climate finance to help improving viability of climate smart agriculture investments so that banks, commercial banks can actually upscale lending for proven investments in which they have a better understanding of the risk factors. It's also important to think about de-risking some private capital by looking at public-private partnerships that are um, designed specifically to uh, enable private finance to scale much, much greater amounts of funding into the agriculture sectors through layered capital structures and other approaches that can really complement the way in which public and private funds serve farmers to invest. It's also critical for public finance to go into strengthening the capacity of private finance providers to manage agricultural risks, to better understand them, to see how they can develop appropriate products that can meet both the needs of the clients in the agriculture sectors, but that can also work within their investment portfolio. Astrid illustrated that small and vulnerable farmers are not always able to access the kind of finance they need. Today, there are new programs to address these needs. For example, the Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program, or ASAP, 
ASAP channels climate finance to smallholder farmers so they can access the information, tools and technologies that will help build their resilience to climate change. We have a lot more on this in the lecture notes. So, on this island, we got to know a lot about planning and budgeting for adaptation planning processes. We explored climate financing and its different sources and how to use these in combination to meet adaptation goals. As usual, you can check out our lecture notes and resources for further learning. Join us next week for the last mile of our journey when we'll collect lessons learned through monitoring and evaluation, discuss new communication approaches for NAPS, and finally receive our UN Certificate of Completion. See you then.